I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Where are our prophets now? Where are those messages God chooses to communicate divine revelation through? In the past, the Creator has sent prophets like Abraham, Siddhartha, Jesus, Muhammad, and many more. Maybe our higher power has switched tactics since we reinterpret God's words as soon as the Creator's prophets leave us. Could it be that Spirit talks to each one of us individually and we haven't learned to listen? On Words of the Prophets, our modern prophets show us how to find the internal prophet that is the I Am, and we discuss the application of spiritual principles in all aspects of our lives. Love and light, everybody. I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Today, my guest is Don Hendrick, who is a teacher at the Thumpton Norbuling Tibetan Buddhist Center here in Santa Fe. Welcome back. Well, thank you, Reverend Phil. It's good to be here. Good to have you. Those of you who have been with me from the beginning, we haven't had Don on in a while, but he's been here with us a few times, way back in the early days. <laughs> <laughs> Today's prophetic topic is, that alone can bring you happiness and peace. And our topic can be found in the booklet written by Lama Thubten Yeshi, titled, Make Your Mind an Ocean. The complete statement reads as follows. Lord Buddha says that all you have to know is what you are, how you exist. You don't have to believe in anything. Just understand your mind, how it works, how attachment and desire arise, how ignorance arises, and where emotions come from. It is sufficient to know the nature of all that. That alone can bring you happiness and peace. And we're going to kind of take that whole statement and really break it down into small parts and go over it. But before we do, why don't you kind of spend a few minutes reintroducing yourself. How did you become a Tibetan Buddhist teacher or anything mm -hmm. you think is relevant? Okay. Yeah, I started my practice of Tibetan Buddhism back in San Francisco in the early 90s, around 92, 93, began studying. Um, I found the organization that I work with currently, FPMT, Foundation for the Preservation of the Mahayana Tradition, around 1996 when I began studying with them and found out very shortly after that that there was a program that they were going to be conducting, a seven-year study program that took place in Italy at our center there, Lama Tsongkhapa Institute. And uh, that program was a, my sort of entryway into teaching in terms of it was designed primarily to help uh, people to become familiar with the traditional Tibetan texts that are taught in the monasteries, uh, the approach to Buddhism from this perspective. And then after I left that program at the end of 2004, I came to, back to New Mexico, began teaching and helping out with our center here in Santa Fe, as well as up in Taos, where I also still teach. So that's in a nutshell, okay. <laughs> my history. <laughs> Let's, I mean, a couple of things. I mean, I, I think most people probably aware of it. Maybe you want to just like, who was mm. the Buddha? What is Buddhism? Sure. And basically, Buddhism goes back to uh, the story of Prince Siddhartha, who lived some 25, 2600 years ago in India. And the story is, is that he became disillusioned at the suffering that he saw uh, that he himself would have to face, as well as that all beings face, and uh, left his very cush cushy palace life and decided to, to seek freedom from suffering. And the story goes that he spent roughly about six years in various meditative um, states and trying to find the answer in that way and pursuing um, that path through the instruction of many great ascetics at the time. But he didn't really find the answer he was seeking. So he kind of went from these extremes of self-indulgence in the palace to the self-mortification of these more rigorous ascetic practices and f decided he would try the middle way, kind of replenishing his strength. He sat under the Bodhi tree and he made the determination to stay there until he figured it all out. And the story goes that he basically, over the course of an evening, attained the state of bodhi, or enlightenment, a state of clear vision of exactly how things exist and uh, the interrelationship of things and a complete freedom from all of the uh, factors that we're going to be talking about in today's session, uh, with all the things that bring us suffering. So from uh, the Buddha himself, uh, he taught for some 45 years, taught a number of traditions, uh, what have come to be known as both the Hinayana, or the individual vehicle, and the Mahayana, the uh, more universal vehicle. Tibetan Buddhism is within the latter. Uh, the Theravadan tradition is within the former. There are 
many other Buddhist traditions that fall in either of those two camps. But Buddhism spread from India uh, into Southeast Asia, primarily initially, and then also began its uh, kind of northeastern uh, route up through China, Japan, Korea, and then into Tibet in roughly the 8th century, and uh, has existed there, or did exist there in a more pure form, uh, all the way into last century, and then of course with the Chinese occupation, uh, isn't practiced quite as fully as it was then. but. So basically, all of these various traditions adapted Buddhism to some extent to their own culture, but at the same time retained some of the integrity of the initial sort of real fundamental teachings that the Buddha gave. So Tibetan Buddhism is a mix of what was a traditional Tibetan Buddhist belief structure combined well, with what Buddha was mm -hmm. teaching? Well, it's, it's more that it took on some of the, the cultural aspects of Tibet, if you will. I mean, the, the tradition that existed there before Buddhism took root in the 8th century uh, came to be known as the Bon. The Bon tradition is uh, often called a more shamanistic tradition. But there's a lot of the flavor of it in terms of the way that Tibetan Buddhism grew and developed. And if you compare Tibetan Buddhism, for example, you go to, to a Tibetan Buddhist temple versus a uh, Zen uh, center or temple, you get a very different perspective in terms of what they're about. You know, the Japanese culture influenced Zen to a large extent in terms of their ascetic, in terms of their way of approaching teachings. So again, while most of them held on to some of the more f core fundamental teachings, uh, if you will, they became influenced by some of these cultural aspects. Not that they diluted in any way the Buddha's teachings, but rather found specific teachings that in, they um, magnified, emphasized, and then worked with those. So focus on one aspect versus another. To some extent. And in the Tibetan tradition, the thing that is probably the most unique uh, characteristic is the practice of Buddhist Tantra. Buddhist Tantra being the more esoteric teachings of the Buddha that basically, as I understand it, are not really found in any, other, any of the other Buddhist traditions other than one small sect in Japan. So uh, the tantric teachings uh, speak to the ability that we have in this human life to utilize this human body as a basis for attaining enlightenment quite quickly, as opposed to the more traditional sutra approach, uh, uh, those teachings that kind of speak to the much more long-term uh, path that the, bo the bodhisattva has to take to attain enlightenment. So those are the ones in particular that I would say that are quite unique to Tibetan Buddhism. Well, I mean... When you talk about a long-term path, my understanding, I mean, the whole thrust of Buddhist seeking was mm -hmm. that, I don't want to call it a quick fix, but <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying. It's right, like, you know, right. we don't have to keep staying on this wheel. Right, right. You know, we don't have to keep reincarnating. We don't yeah. have to come back. Right. So mm -hmm. how does that, so the, the, the sutra teaching versus the tantric teaching mm -hmm comes down to different goals. And so, so when we talk about just attaining one's own liberation from the wheel of life, from the cycling, from existence to existence, then this is a much more um, easily attainable goal, you know, because it's about one's own individual liberation, as opposed to the Mahayana path, which is, again, what is practiced in Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Chan Buddhism. These are focused on the longer-term goal that does take more time to sort of um, accumulate the necessary uh, positive potential and energy, what we call merit, in order to attain this greater goal of Buddhahood. So what the Buddha is said to have attained is the goal of Bodhi, complete awakening. But this wasn't, you know, in a single lifetime. This was preceded by many, many lifetimes, they say, of practicing as a bodhisattva, and then eventually coming to that culmination through the accumulation of all that energy and wisdom to be able to manifest in that form. But for all of us who are practicing the Mahayana tradition, there is this understanding that in the sutra presentation, it can take, you know, well, the traditional teaching, say, three countless great eons, which is a phenomenally long period of time, to become fully enlightened, whereas to become simply liberated from samsara, liberated from the wheel of existence, is a much more short-term goal that can even be accomplished in, you know, within few lifetimes, maybe one or two lifetimes, depending again upon the individual practitioner. But and nirvana was get you to which state? Well, nirvana is a state of complete cessation of all of the suffering and the causes of suffering. 
that state in and of itself is the end result of the practice of those who are just seeking their own liberation. When they attain that state, they say they abide in a state of solitary peace. Now, according to some of the Mahayana traditions, that isn't the final goal, though, of course. So then they, while they might be attaining in that state of peacefulness, in terms of their mind no longer having to go through all of the various you know, states of existence in samsara, uh, they basically will um, eventually be roused from that state of solitary peace and be put on the bodhisattva path and said, you know, the job isn't quite finished. You still need to do some additional work. So the view from the Mahayana is it's better to go ahead and do that work initially and enter that path right from the beginning that seeks full enlightenment, that seeks complete Buddhahood. So this is, again, there's different ways. I can only speak to the Tibetan Buddhist perspective on this because obviously many of the other traditions would posit that there's maybe mm, not quite as much of a distinct difference between these two goals. But from a B Tibetan Buddhist perspective, one is a lesser form of uh, enlightenment or nirvana, whereas the more complete form of enlightenment is going the full distance to Buddhahood attaining what is actually called a non-abiding nirvana, meaning that you get that state, that same peacefulness, but you're not going to hang out in some sort of solitary state. Through the force of your compassion, you continue in the world, and you take rebirth again through the force of your compassion and manifest in the world through the force of your compassion to help other sentient beings. So it's another perspective to the Buddhist path. Got so many questions, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> um, so in Tibetan tradition, uh -huh. And I think it's common in a few of the other hill country traditions, I don't know another way to, mm -hmm. like Bhutan, and to the, mm -hmm. that there is a reincarnated head. Mm -hmm. How does that, which tradition does that fit in with? Is that now mm -hmm. the willingness to come back and continue to teach? Absolutely. It's, I mean, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, for example, in the Tibetan perspective is, seen as uh, the reincarnation of the Buddha of compassion. So there's this Buddha of compassion called Avalokiteshvara in Sanskrit, Chenrezig in Tibetan. And the idea is that this is an, a particular manifestation of what we mean by Buddhahood, Buddhahood being the full perfection of our minds and our existence, manifesting in a form to be able to help sentient beings. And so the idea of a reincarnation is simply that energy taking rebirth again and again through the lineage of we're up to the 14th Dalai Lama now, that basically is uh, serving as a, um, a direct guide on the path for Tibetans, for practicing Tibetan Buddhists, as well as we see certainly with His Holiness, for everyone in this world to yeah. kind of begin to open up to their potential, to open up to the views of compassion and loving kindness towards each other. So this is the idea behind it, is that this is a... Um, those who, who have that view often hold that this is a Buddha manifesting in this way. If it isn't a Buddha, we would say at least this is a bodhisattva, bodhisattva with that strong compassion that decides they will you know, stay around as long as they need to to help sentient beings be free from their suffering and continue to take rebirth through the force of their compassion. So, As a totally separate side note, there was a <laughs> wonderful article I was just reading um, done in a Vedic tradition, mm -hmm. which talked about the difference, the distinctions between reincarnation mm -hmm. and rebirth. Oh, interesting. And yeah. what you were talking about is exactly what he talked about in the article, where mm -hmm. he talks about rebirth is where you're advanced enough along the way to mm -hmm. say, here's what I'm going to do when I come back. Mm -hmm. Reincarnation is where you haven't gotten that advance yet, <laughs> you're still going back there, and you're right. kind of paying off yeah. the karma, and, and it, you know. And that, that, I, I find that whole distinction fascinating, just yeah. how he separated out those two terms, and you were just kind of talking, sound like the exact same I think, thing. I think so. I don't know if the terminology would be quite the same. But there is this term in Tibetan for a reincarnated master. It's usually the term tulku. A tulku te technically means an emanation body. It's kind of like the idea of this is an emanation, a form of a Buddha, of a being that has made that determination to keep returning again and again as a particular lineage of a, of a master to be able to help people who have a predisposition towards that master and that tradition to be able to practice and continue to receive the teachings that will help them to attain enlightenment themselves. So this is the idea behind it, particularly when it becomes these tulkus or reincarnated masters. And there seems to be quite a number of them. 
Absolutely. So this is yeah. not a <clears throat> singular unique occurrence to the Dalai Lama. This no, is no. Actually, there are quite a number of them. And there's a whole within the Kagyu tradition, the tradition of the Karmapas, um, many of the great Nyingma masters, which is the oldest school of Tibetan Buddhism, also you know, reincarnating these Rinpoches that continue to take rebirth again and again. So it's by no means kind of unique to um, the Dalai Lama situation. And then, of course, the individual students of those masters often do hold the view that this is a Buddha, that this is a fully enlightened being appearing in this way. But as I said, whether it's someone who has accomplished that goal or whether it's a bodhisattva working their way on the path, it's the same principle behind yeah. it, which is to have that unbroken lineage of instruction, guidance, uh, that is the manifestation of their compassion and their wish to help others. And it's almost like if you have to get the distinction, you don't really know what the distinction is. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. <laughs> um, so the Mahayana tradition is one of four major traditions in Tibetan Buddhism? Oh, well, the Mahayana is the overall umbrella. Okay. In terms of the, the four traditions within Tibetan Buddhism, the one that the FPMT that I work with is part of and that the Dalai Lamas are trained in is called the Golukpa, the Golukpa being the... Um, last of the four traditions to form, and it formed up on the basis of Lama Tsongkhapa's teachings who lived around the late 14th, early 15th century. So the, the, this movement, this preservation, mm -hmm. are we saying that this Dvayana tradition is fading away? Or are we saying it's becoming diluted? What, what, what Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're using that word preservation, it sounds pretty right. serious. I, I, it's quite kind of a curious thing. When, when Lama, Lama Thupten Yeshe is the one who came up with this title of the foundation for the preservation of the Mahayana tradition, it's kind of, um, it does bring to mind, well, then, we know, what, are we tr what is it that we're preserving and what is the purity of what we're preserving and does it need preserving or is it actually going to be able to sustain itself? Um, I think that when we look at the history of the Mahayana, which I don't know in the great detail that many of these university professors who study it from that perspective would know, but the Mahayana tradition, although they hold that it was taught at the time of the Buddha, was not really the initial tradition to take off and take root in Asia. Uh, all those uh, teachings that disseminated down to southeastern Asia, to Thailand, Cambodia, and Indonesia, you know, all of that area, are basically... Um, in the Hinayana tradition, and this is because of, as I understand it, the Pali Canon, which was the first sort of written corpus of the Buddha's teachings in the Pali language, only contained primarily the Hinayana Sutras. And so the Hinayana Sutras became that vehicle for transmitting the teachings in those initial centuries of after the Buddha died. Are we talking about what is also called the Dhammapada? Uh, the Dhammapada is part of the Pali, Pali canon. So there it's not the whole canon, it's just part not of it. A, as not as I, again, I'm not an expert on these sorts of things, so I'd be hard-pressed if someone you know, said for sure. I, I, I might need to do more research on that. But the Dhammapada is usually referring to sort of a collection of sayings of the Buddha that is one of those uh, in that corpus, as I understand it. But that whole tradition is really what took root. The Mahayana teachings are said to have gone through, and there's a lot of mythology around some of this, but you know, many of them, they said, were taken to the land of the Nagas, these sort of serpent-like beings, and then Nagarjuna, who's a renowned Mahayana master who came from the Nalanda Indian uh, Buddhist tradition, uh, Nalanda Monastery. He basically went to the land of the Nagas and brought these sutras back, and then that was the reinvigoration of the Mahayana tradition. But as I understand it, throughout all that time frame, there was a lot of dispute among Buddhist practitioners as to what were, what were the true teachings of the Buddha. And this comes down to, again, regardless of whether it's Hinayana or Mahayana, Pali Canon versus Sanskrit teachings, the test of whether these teachings are true or not isn't who did they come from and can I have faith in that person. It's rather, are they truth for myself? Can I actually attain realizations? Can I actually see the truth of these teachings in my own experience, through my own meditation, through my own contemplation, mm -hmm. and so on. So the Mahayana tradition um, you know, took root in India um, in that earlier part of uh, the, I'd say, everything from just before uh, the Common Era and then into the beginning of the Common Era. Uh, those teachings, again, are what ended up getting disseminated into China and so on. 
So when we call it the preservation of the Mahayana tradition, I think there is this idea that Lama Yeshe sees the Tibetan Buddhist uh, jewel of teachings uh, that are firmly within the Mahayana as something that does need some preserving, some uh, importance uh, to not lose these teachings in this world. Once again, there's a lot of mythology around the Buddha's teachings and how long they'll last in a particular world system. And the Buddha himself made these sorts of claims of, you know, they're only going to exist for some 5,000 years after he starts the wheel of Dharma turning in this world. So uh, there becomes some more importance the further you get from when the Buddha actually gave the teachings to the need to make sure that they're preserved, that they're retained and practiced. It's quite amazing in terms of when I think of our own experience in the West of not having had access to these teachings for so long. While they existed in Tibet and in many other places you know, for centuries and centuries, um, you know, it's really a pretty new phenomenon in terms of Buddhism in the West. So I think that Lama Yeshe's intention in calling this Western organization the foundation for the preservation of the Mahayana tradition was that he really felt that the West was perhaps where it would be preserved, where it would be retained particularly with the situation that occurred in Tibet. So let's get down into our prophetic topic. Okay. <laughs> that alone can bring you happiness and peace. And that statement starts with, make your mind, well, it comes from the book, the booklet, Make Your Mind an Ocean. Mm -hmm. So let's well two things i mean would i be fair to say that in a lot of ways buddha was the first psychologist i think so i think actually one teacher that i had said he was the first sort of a cognitive psychologist or cognitive therapist i mean at some level i mean the buddha was really about the mind uh -huh. the mind being uh, from the buddhist perspective the fundamental arena of where all of our experiences come from and where we uh, have them and, and experience them so when we talk about mind in Buddhism, what we're talking about, just to have you know, the terminology agreed upon, is not this sort of um, thing that is completely embedded within our physical being. So in the Western scientist perspective, what we mean by mind or consciousness, as I understand it, is what most Western scientists would hold, is that it becomes uh, classified as an emergent property which means that on the basis of this physical body and having a brain that has all sorts of electrochemical things going on in it, all this gray matter in a nervous system, that somehow on the basis of all this physical stuff, we have the nature of experience or consciousness, awareness. And then when all of this sort of stuff stops, consciousness or awareness ceases as well. From a Buddhist perspective, this is not what we would hold. We would hold that mind itself has its own continuity. So mind in Buddhism is defined in terms of its nature and its function. And its nature is clarity, meaning it is non-material, meaning it has an aspect of uh, clearly illuminating and being a receptacle for everything that it knows. And that leads to its function, which is to be aware, to know. So mind is that which is clear and knowing. It has its own continuity of mental moments that give rise to later moments, and so we never find kind of a beginning to it. Are we saying then that the mind is, for lack of a better term, in other traditions, the equivalent of the soul? It's that which carries the karma? Um, we definitely have those, those same sort of characteristics. The mind has its continuity. So, in effect, when we talk about what is it that goes from life to life, at the subtlest level, it's our sort of very basic fundamental consciousness. Now, with it, what will be carried with it, in a sense, are all of the potentials and seeds and uh, imprints that have come from our past experiences that we call our karma. These actions that we've done through the force of our minds, primarily, the thoughts, intentions we've had, as well as the actions we've committed on the basis of those mental states, uh, our actions of our body, uh, our actions of our speech. Uh, all these things that we engage in, nothing is wasted. Everything makes some sort of imprint that goes forward and provides the sort of propulsion behind where that mind goes to, the experiences it has. So karma is the shaping factor by which mind creates our experiences, creates everything that we know, the states of uh, existence that we have. Does Buddha teaching talk about the mind as being connected to a whole yet separate 
again to kind of mm -hmm. I'm equating it to the soul. The mm -hmm. soul is part. Yeah, you know, the soul is the individual. Mm -hmm. The spirit is the greater. <laughs> you know, and the soul is part of the spirit, mm -hmm. but it is unique in that it carries its karma, its destiny with it. Mm -hmm. mm, it's kind of a tough question. I think that in Buddhism, there's so much emphasis on interdependence that it's kind of hard to sort of isolate it out and call it something completely independent. Um, there's, within what we mean by mind, obviously, we're talking about a unique entity that can be isolated in terms of its own um, continuity of mental moments, again, that continue to give rise to our experience. But in terms of the physical being, um, it's really quite related, and it's very hard to completely separate the two. Even at the subtlest levels, they say that you don't ever have kind of an independent thing we call consciousness that can somehow be completely isolated from matter or physical being, uh, because even at the very subtlest level, there's some form of physicality to consciousness that acts as sort of a mount or a, um, a way in which consciousness kind of has its ability to continue to move forward. So in a sense, I mean, in the, the highest teachings, going back to this idea of Tantra, they say that this sort of physicality is what we call wind energy or air, and this kind of um, movement factor that allows the mind to continue to move forward, allows it con to continue to um, have varied experiences. So, so it exists very, without a body? It exists without a full physical body in terms of a grosser body. Okay. But, and there are some states of existence that the Buddha posited that are what we call kind of the formless realm, where uh, beings through the force of very strong meditative concentration can have an existence that's not so grossly embodied. They can actually be just a mental being, if you will, with that very subtle wind energy kind of keeping them moving through that experience, not in a physical plane, but just in terms of propelling from moment to moment. And then eventually coming out of that once again, because it's a karmically conditioned experience. But it can have that level of separateness from a grosser body. So a, a, a Dalai Lama, for instance, mm -hmm. who reincarnates, I'm not that familiar with the history. Mm -hmm. Has there been like, okay, I drop body number eight, and here I am automatically in body number nine, or is there a space in between them? <laughs> well, what they, what they're, again, these get to be kind of um, hard to, to exactly identify because I think it happens differently in different times. But what they would say is that because, because of our particular experience needing to um, interact and be um, experiencing these enlightened beings in the form of humans, that they would go through the normal process that a human would go through. So in a sense, when they die, when their body ceases to function and the consciousness leaves that body, there is a similar process of that consciousness then going into the fertilized egg within the womb of a woman that basically then gives birth nine months later to the new incarnation of the Dalai Lama. And this is why there's this tradition that's brought out in films like Kundun and what have you, where they go and they find these reincarnated beings through various techniques. But the principle behind it is, is that we have the karma, we have the conditioning to see these Buddhas manifesting as human beings. And so therefore, as human beings, they don't just magically appear. They appear through the same process that yeah. we appear, which is within the course of some period of time after their passing, there's then someone who is impregnated and eventually gives birth. And then a few years down the road, someone comes along and through all these various rituals identifies that this is the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama. <laughs> so so I, I, I guess then what I, the question I was asking is there is a, sp a period of time and space mm -hmm. where the reincarnation process is not in the physical form, in True. any shape. True, but you know this is this is, uh, but it's 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 not that it isn't in a physical form. It's just that it's probably in a much more subtle physical form, particularly for us who are conditioned. Mm -hmm. These are getting into a lot of complicated okay, topics. Okay, I hear but, what you're saying. But but for for you and I. Well, I can't speak for you. I can speak for me. <laughs> <laughs> you might be a Buddha for all I know. But for myself, when I die, my consciousness will eventually leave this body. They say that that can take a short while, you know, up to a few days to happen even. But when it leaves this body, it will go into what's called an intermediate state, or the bardo it's often referred to as. And that intermediate state is a form of physicality, a very subtle one, though, much more spirit-like than it is 
grosser physicality like we have. Um, and then eventually, through the force of one's karma, you find a rebirth in that intermediate existence. It's sort of a holding area, if you will, where you're driven by your karma to go seek your new existence. Now, somebody like the Dalai Lama wouldn't, if this is really a Buddha manifesting in this way, wouldn't go through that process simply because they're not being driven by their karma and desire to be re-embodied. They're driven by their compassion and they take rebirth again through the force of that and it becomes a much different process. But ideally, yes, I mean, you know, going back to this idea of a mind having some separateness from the body, it will have a separation from a grosser form of body but even at the very subtlest level, what I was calling that kind of wind energy, there's never any real kind of complete separation where consciousness exists completely independently. So if we take that back to this idea of a soul, I mean, it's very hard to find the exact equivalent for a soul in Tibetan Buddhism or this perspective because you don't ever have anything that has all the features and elements that a soul does, I think, from my understanding of the soul, which is, again, somewhat limited. Well, I think, yeah, and different religions, different theologies define soul differently. So, I mean, I don't think there's any one hmm. clear cut, this is the definition. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was just throwing that out there as mm -hmm. trying to see if we could, like, equate the two of them to, mm -hmm. you know, for help. Yeah. The, the I think there's similarities, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the mind has all of this, mm -hmm. I was going to say, history with it and, and potential <laughs> along mm -hmm. with it. Comes back, mm -hmm. takes on human form, gets mm -hmm. physical. Mm -hmm. What happens now? Well, the, the, the thing to keep in mind, again, is when there is that new incarnation of someone where the, their mind has come together once again with a f more grosser physical form, and let's say it's in a human body, well, then there's, of course, the, the karma that propelled you into that existence that has already begun to shape what that experience is like. For example, why, is, why are we born in Western culture with the bodies we have versus being over in an Eastern culture or an African culture or wherever the case might be? These are all karmically determined. Does Buddhism believe in reincarnation in non-human? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. So, we, so Buddhism embraces it, it come back mm -hmm. as an animal or a plant or... Well, plants would be questionable. I think there may be some Buddhist traditions where they hold that plant is sentient life, but in our tradition they say there are six forms of existence, uh, six realms or experiences, states, uh, the humans and animals being two of those. The other two that are said to be a, a lesser form or primarily because they're a form of greater suffering are a realm that's called the hell realm simply because it, it models the sort of things we hear about in hellish existences you know, great amounts of suffering due to heat, cold, what have you, other factors. And then the ghost of what, or the, the realm that's called the ghost, hungry ghost realm or the preto realm. The hungry ghosts are those beings that are driven by their strong desire to continue to seek to be satiated, but they have obstacles to that satiation through their um, physical being. And then there are the two upper realms, the gods and the demigods that have even more blissful states of existence, similar perhaps to what we think of when we think of heaven in the Western culture. But it's not, a, again, a permanent state. It's simply a place through the force of that good karma. They go there, they experience all sorts of wonderful things. That existence ends, and then they go on to another state. So absolutely, there are many more realms besides what we experience in the human realm. But all of that, the individual existence is determined by a karmic seed or potential. And then how that existence is filled out. They often call this the projecting karma that gets you there and then the finishing or completing karma that fills out what that life is all about in terms of, you know, are you born into a relatively wealthy situation or a poor one? Are you born into uh, places where there's, you know, favorable elements in terms of the, the environment you're in or is it really challenging and difficult? All of these are to some extent determined through the force of your own actions and what ripened at the time of your moving into that new existence. So how does mind does not work independently? Mm -hmm. So it, my, mm. I mean, we're doing this show, so somewhere along the way, <laughs> you know, your mind and my mind agree to be here together. Exactly. <laughs> and we would say that even there's some sort of karmic potential that caused us to have some kind of connection in this life. 
some you yeah. know, something that ripened from prior experiences. But what we would say again is that those things are the determining factors, if you will, as to what we experience, but how we experience it is where the mind comes into play in even greater detail. So, Because this is where the Buddha's teachings become more instrumental is because when we say, okay, I have the karma to experience this human life with this particular you know, set of what we call aggregates, this collection of mind and body that's together on the basis of, of uh, you know, all the causes and conditions that led to this, well, I can choose, if I'm paying attention, to do something with this mind and with this experience that's very different from what created it in the first place. So, you know, so I'm talking about a negative situation. So like in my mind, my, my, my spiritual mind, my mm -hmm. eternal mind, whatever mm -hmm. phrase I, we could use, mm -hmm. enters into a physical body. Mm -hmm. Or joins up with, uh, links up with, yeah. Okay, then there is a contamination factor that mm -hmm. does not allow the mind of the body to recognize the mind of the greater mind. Um, maybe it's more that it doesn't allow the, some of the contamination and the way that we, we enter into this existence so clouded by our past actions and all of that baggage we're carrying forward that doesn't allow me to know the real nature of my mind. I mean, it's not that there's two sort of separate levels of mind. There's, there's this more fundamental nature of mind that we can talk about as kind of the core of it, but then there's more like concentric circles of experience that go around it that become grosser and grosser. Does karma <laughs> get played out sequentially, so to speak? I do something mm. this life, my next life I got to deal with it? Um, they can, but there's, there's the most, um, the determining factors as to what ripens is more around the various conditions that we happen to meet. And so while we plant all these various seeds of karma, um, it may take many, many lifetimes for some of them to ripen. When we look at the fact that, um, this is again getting into some other teachings perhaps, but when we look at the fact that in an individual life, we create countless karmas to take another rebirth. But at the end of this life, only one of those will ripen in terms of our next rebirth. And we've done that in countless other lifetimes. So there's many of these karmic potentials that lie dormant for lifetimes and lifetimes until they move to the front of the pack and somehow lead us into that ne next existence. How but other experiences, for example, like you know, being very generous in this life might actually ripen more quickly in terms of our next life. How, how do we create karma? <laughs> I mean, what, is, how, what does Buddha teach about mm -hmm. this? the dynamic that creates okay. the karma. So this gets into, I perhaps you know, kind of addresses in this quote that you had from Lama Yeshe, kind of the things that we do need to know, which is, again, how the mind works. But moreover, what are these various factors that play a role, such as ignorance and then attachment and aversion or this kind of anger energy? But what, what basically we say is that, is that at the fundamental level of our minds, although there is that sort of clear, pure, nature that we can identify, what has happened is we become obscured as to the nature of reality. We become obscured as to how things actually exist. And so we've been walking around from life to life with a veil over our eyes, with basically not being able to see the truth of reality, not being able to understand that things don't exist in the way that they appear, that they lack any sort of concrete, independent existence. Instead, everything is a dependent origination or a dependent arising. And these, it's on the basis of this sort of initial veiling over of how things exist that we then go on to sort of fabricate, first of all, an I or a sense of self on the basis of the collection of this stuff that isn't there in the way that we think it is at all. Kind of, and this is one of the problems, again, when Buddha looked at some of these teachings around a soul or what was called Atman in the Hindu yeah, tradition. Yeah. You know, his, his was a view of Anatman, that there is no sort of perpetual, unchanging essence of who you are that is exactly that, that there is in essence really only this ever-changing collection of stuff that we simply have put the label of I on, put the identity of I on, and the identity doesn't exist from its own side, doesn't exist in its own right. 
But ultimately, the mind is the accumulator of every one of those experiences. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing, in a sense, is, is although we have this mind going from life to life, and it does bring about all these experiences, it's perpetuated by this fundamental wrong view, by this fundamental confusion. So I create karma mm -hmm. every time I, in one form or another, attach to mm -hmm. something other than the advancement of the mind. Um, any time that we attach to anything that's together with that ignorance, we create what we would call, again, that contaminated karma. So it's like whenever we have... define ignorance? This ignorance is this not knowing the nature of reality. Okay. Not understanding the way things actually exist. So if I really get upset if this cup would <laughs> fall and break, it's like my life is not okay because I just broke my blue cup. <laughs> right. That would create karma. Uh, you would definitely create some imprints from that. Yeah. yeah. In terms of your strong attachment to the cup, to its needing to be there. And yes. And even if the attachment to its unchanging nature, which you think is there, but actually is quite capable of changing very quickly the moment that it falls off the table and breaks. Yes. So, so these, are the, these, are the, I mean, these are some levels of misconceptions. The deepest misconception, again, that we have that's driving the whole show or the deepest ignorance is this, again, not getting how things actually exist, not getting the way that they lack existing um, in a, that more independent way that we think that they do. And these are very complex teachings. I mean, we, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you study these extensively over the course of many, many different subjects, being exposed to them continually and then meditating on them and eventually developing some insight into the nature of reality and what's called uh, the wisdom of emptiness. Yeah, it's in, and I don't know if this falls within you know, the Tibetan Buddhism tradition, but it's the story mm. that in, in my the version that I read of the Dhammapada, which there's a lot mm -hmm. of translations from the Pali, right. so yeah, you never know. <laughs> it's interesting that way, but he talked about how there would be potential students would come to mm -hmm. Buddha and would kind of like, you know, I want to study with you, mm -hmm. but you don't talk about, you don't teach this, you don't teach that, you don't talk about heaven and hell. It's like, why would I study with you? And Buddha's basic response was, if it doesn't get you to the other side, it isn't worth anything. Exactly. Yeah, you know, so yeah. The, what he was teaching, yeah. I think is exactly what we're talking about here, yeah. is that basic... All this other stuff, yeah, kind of interesting, mm -hmm. but if you just if you get to that nirvanic meditation, you'll have all your answers. Just focus in on the meditation. Absolutely, I think that that's a really good point. I mean, when we talk about some of the other details we've touched on even today, I mean, these are all kind of the the filling out of it in terms of our conventional world. But the deeper truths are there, and the deeper truths can be seen. This is the Buddha's message, is that if we go and we investigate and come to know our own minds, come to know the mistakes we're making in our own minds, come to see the truth, uh, and then you know, through that process, we will attain freedom. Through that process, the entire structure that is built on this foundation of ignorance will just topple. Will crumble. Yeah. So in, there is... in. I guess, in my understanding, built into the nirvanic process, what the Christian process would call grace. I think so, yeah. So that if we get nirvana, mm -hmm. or the more we, the closer we get to it, the less we're bound by whatever karma we brought with us. We've, mm -hmm. we've gotten past that place, so we don't have to go back and experience it. Mm -hmm. I think so. I mean, you know, they, they, what they basically say is that as you proceed along the path, the effects of the, the karma in terms of being under the control of them in the way that we were diminish greatly, you know, to the point where then they, they lose their power completely simply because there's no structure to uphold them. And that's you know. getting off the wheel. Exactly. That's what we mean by liberation. Again, this idea of, of Buddhahood goes one step further and says there's an even deeper level of obscuration that we can remove. And that is the obscuration um, that is present in our minds through the imprints from that ignorance. It's kind of like this additional veil that once that veil is removed and we can have the clear seeing, that's great. And we can experience liberation. But there's a deeper veil that still causes things to have 
sort of a, a false appearance. And that false appearance we're no longer buying into, but we need to remove that eventually, and then we can attain the full state of Buddhahood. So what you're saying is like there's a... This, that last veil removes my need to see because I'm one with everything I'm seeing. I think so. I mean, it's one way of explaining it. I think that the, when we talk about the experience of Buddhahood, it's, it's said to be one of, of complete connection with all things, simply because there's no longer any sort of separate s sense of self or even the appearance or the illusion of that. Through the force of removing that last bit of obscuration, the mind com is completely unbounded. The mind is omniscient. They say that a Buddha has absolute knowledge of everything that exists. And of course, the knowledge of that is there for a reason, so that the Buddha can then benefit very clearly every sentient being, exactly according to their own level of wisdom, knowledge, obscuration, what have you. So, so basically, all the stuff we were going to talk about, fear, <laughs> attachment, desire, ignorance, all of that is just a reflection of not learning, not having the teacher, not doing the practice. Not, not, yeah, and ex not having developed the wisdom in our own minds, you know, which comes from all those things. Yeah. comes from the practice, which comes from the teachings that we get, which comes from having a master in our lives who can introduce us to those teachings. So it's a whole chain of, of things that go on. I mean, if we've got time, I might just use a, a quick Go analogy. Yes. If, if we talk about our dream states, for example, and maybe some people can do lucid dreaming and be quite aware in their dreams, but for most of us, dream states are those things that we fall into in our sleep that we buy into completely. And various people appear in our dreams and things are going on and we're totally caught up in it. And when we awake, we're sometimes totally surprised that what we were experiencing wasn't real. So if we use just the dream state as the example, and it's not in a perfect analogy, but there is a level of ignorance that's operative in our dreams. Then, because we think that everything that is appearing in our dreams has a real nature, that it's actually that person that we know in our real life that's appearing in our dreams, and we're actually in that situation, and we're going here and going there. The, what the Buddha says is that this is how we're operating in our everyday lives. We think that things exist in a level of reality that they have no, not even an atom of, when it comes to their actual existence. We're fabricating a level of reality, just as we are in our dreams, that we can awake, awake to the negation of that, to understanding that it doesn't exist that way at all. So in our dreams, we kind of have two things operative. We have an ignorance that doesn't know that that's just a dream object, but moreover, we have an ignorance that's holding that it's a real object. Yeah. And on the basis of that real object, we might have desire arising in our dreams. We might have fear arising in our dreams. We might have anger arising in our dreams, all because we're fabricating a situation on the basis of things not having that level of reality at all. So in a sense, we've bought into the illusion. Exactly. And so what the Buddha says is in our waking life, we're doing that. You know, not just in our dreams, obviously, but in our waking life, we are also buying into a level of reality that isn't in accord with how things actually exist. So going back to your comment, it, it absolutely comes down to we need to then practice coming to understand that knowledge ourselves, to analyze how things exist. The Tibetan Buddhist tradition very much follows the teachings of Nagarjuna and great masters of the Indian uh, Nalanda tradition that spell out very clearly how we analyze, how we look at things and come to understand how they actually exist. So the purpose of the meditation is to mm -hmm. connect us to that void, to give us a mm -hmm. greater and greater glimpse mm -hmm. that this isn't real, that there's something bigger out there. Absolutely. To help us to uh, taste that knowledge for ourselves at a very deep level, which can really only be attained through meditative states. Beautiful. <laughs> We're starting to run down on what mm -hmm. doesn't exist, which is time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want to make an announcement tell people I know we've been flashing contact information okay. for you but you know are there regular sittings and actually yeah. tell them a little bit about the Thub to Norbal Link Center okay. where it is and everything we yeah. never got to that yeah Thub to Norbal Link is over on 2nd Street now we're right across from Back Road Pizza so you can find us pretty easily um, we have a pretty full schedule you might go to our website to check everything out 
but in essence, we have a couple of classes, different class levels. Our Sunday morning program is probably the most appropriate for people who are beginning their studies. It's called Discovering Buddhism, and it's an ongoing series that goes through all the topics of the stages of the path to enlightenment. And then we also do have other introductory classes, such as Buddhism in a Nutshell, which we're actually beginning this week, um, but we offer this periodically. It's about an eight-week course that introduces people to that uh, arena of Tibetan Buddhism. And then more advanced classes as well. And you teach all these classes? Uh, I don't teach all of them. We do have a few people who help with some of the more beginning programs, but I do Discovering Buddhism and some of the more advanced classes as well. And then we, of course, have opportunity for people to sit and do other practices as well, meditation. So. And are these classes sequential? I mean, can somebody drop in the middle of a course or they have to start <laughs> at the beginning? I think for Discovering Buddhism, it's relatively easy to come in in the middle. Uh, towards the end, it becomes a little more challenging. I, ideally, it's good to start from the beginning, but it's about a two to two and a half year course of study. So it's good if people just come as they wish. We'll, we do our best to try to catch everyone up to what we've already covered, but it is intended as an introductory course and not as an advanced level course. So okay. certainly welcome to come anytime. And we can't mention specifics, but are there fees or donations, or how's that work? Everything is done by donation. I think the suggested donation that our administration put out there was a 10 to $20 per session, but by no means should anyone feel that they can't come if they can't afford it. We are more than happy to have people there, and you know, just being there is, is good. If you uh, can't afford something to help to support the center, it's wonderful, but if not, it's completely understandable. Okay, I'm going to make a couple of announcements, so okay. I want to get back to a couple of things. Um, you are watching us on public access television, which means this is a partnership between us here in the studio and you there on the other side of the whatever size screen TV you're watching us on. And without you, there won't be any us. How's that for concept, huh? <laughs> Sounds like interdependence to me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> anyway, what I'm saying is want to hear from you. Love to hear from you. Comments, questions. Maybe you have a topic you'd like to hear me explore with somebody. Maybe you'd like to explore a topic with me. That's not unheard of. We've done that numerous times. So get involved. Let us know what it is you want to see and hear and what you don't want to see and hear. Also, to let you know that I am a spiritual counselor. Um, I really believe in the fact that, in a lot of sense, I think what uh, Don and I was talking about here, it's real hard to solve our problems, if not near impossible, to solve our problems with the same instrument that creates them. And it's by using spirit, by learning how to utilize certain tools like meditation, and how do I apply that to my waking life, so to speak, gets us out of these situations we find ourselves in. And my services are on a donation basis, so don't let money become an obstacle. Spirit, the universe, whatever you choose to call it, God takes care of me. So if you want to make a donation, that's beautiful. If you can't, that's beautiful too. Nobody gets turned away. Next week we're going to have Shubhaji. She is a Vedic teacher and we're going to be talking about what is the Vedant and what does it teach and what it doesn't teach. So tune in next week and uh, learn about these things. Um, you know, I just want to throw in this one other thing. I mean, Don and I spent some time here talking about terms, and there's some, you know, I, I think I'm more of a universalist in some ways, and I see these terms as slight differences that are talking about the same thing. It doesn't matter what you call it, doesn't matter what you do, just do something, and we'll, you'll be amazed what your life looks like. So, questions. I wanted to ask this from the very early on. We didn't get to it, and just but I kept holding on to it. In Buddha's teachings and his discourses, mm -hmm. did he ever talk about how many lives it took him to get to his to being Buddha? <laughs> 
Uh, I don't know that he actually s set a specific number, but again, there is this idea, and in in, as we study it in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, the Sutra Path, talking about this number of three countless great eons. I can't tell you how long that is. Okay. <laughs> Someone told me once that a, a single countless great eon is something like 10 to the 59th years, and I don't know whether this is true or not. But you're talking about probably an awful long time. Um, Again, it's not to say that that's the re requisite time, but we can find Tibetan Buddhism through the vehicle of Tantra does teach a more immediate obtaining of that goal. However, it's only for those who have the predisposition to practice at that level. So it's a very tricky question in terms of how long it takes any individual to become fully enlightened. Or if we get to choose, then we could kind of just decide, I want, uh, I, I, I want the quick path. I want instant gratification. <laughs> well, and this is one of the things they say is, of course, to have the quick path, you have to have that really pure compassion for others that finds it unbearable that others are suffering while you remain unenlightened. So it doesn't have to do with yeah. the gratification for oneself as much as it has to do with becoming the vehicle for others to obtain uh, the peace and happiness that they seek. So is there a place in Buddhist teachings where this collective mind, so to speak, is totally liberated. Does he talk about time like that? Well, I don't know if there's anything that we call a kind of a collective mind. Even when we talk about what, what all the minds of Buddhas, all those enlightened beings, at some level there's really not a lot to distinguish any one of them because they're no longer on any specific karmic path that is you know, more defined in the way that ours are. But there is a, a similarity to the states of mind that all those Buddhas are experiencing. And I guess at that point, when we all attain that state, there will be all of one mind at that level. Yeah, and that's, I mean, because if we're here, I mean, we're learning, comp it's teaching compassion mm -hmm. in a non-attached way. Absolutely. You know, so that there's a reason, I would assume, for that compassion, uh, and that's, mm -hmm. To the, I would say the collective, and maybe not the right phraseology, but mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, we're ran out of time, <laughs> okay. even though it doesn't exist. We run out of it. <laughs> it's amazing how quick it flies. It does, <laughs> Don. I thank you so much. We're going to have you okay. back again, right? I'll be back. Yes. Oh, yes. good. I have another t off <laughs> camera. We'll talk about the next topic I have in mind. <laughs> okay. This popped to me during the show too when you, you said something. Okay. I want to thank you all. It's we're here to serve. We're here to carry a message. You know, you can pick up the newspaper, you can turn on the TV, and you get all this crazy news about all the craziness in the world, and you can think that really, you know, it's helpless and it's hopeless. It's not. We have the power. That, to me, is at the core of every religion, no matter what they call it, no matter how they teach you how to get there. We have the power, some say gradually, some say quickly, to change how we perceive things, and as we change how we perceive things, things start to change. Use it. Become one with it. Change the world you're living in. You don't like some of the stuff? Change your perceptions. Change the way you attach to it and don't. So until next week, be, with, with every, be one with everything. Walk in love and light. Blessings to you all. I'm Reverend Phil. And I've been your host for Words of the Prophets. Thank you for tuning in. Please join me again next week, same time, same channel, for more Words of the Prophets.